It is the 30th anniversary of Gremlins 2, which is nuts. 30 years? Insane. Where did the time go? Anyway, we're going to be celebrating in a whole bunch of different ways, but right now, I'm going to be talking to Billy Pelter himself, Zach Galligan, and also a special guest who you'll have to stick around and find out who it is. We're going to ask a bunch of questions and get some of your questions answered, so let's just dive right into it. All right, well, I am here with Zach Gallagher, Billy Peltzer himself. Thank you so much for chatting with us today about Gremlins 2. It's been 30 years. Does it seem like so much time has gone by, no time has gone by? How does it feel? It seems impossible, and it's that weird uh, time paradox where it seems like it was just yesterday, and it also seems like it was forever ago, simultaneously. I mean, yeah. I guess because I remember it so well, the memories are fresh but it does seem like a long, long time ago. Yeah, 30 years. I mean, that's it's not yeah, nothing. It's crazy. <laughs> so what was it like being the face, being the star of an entire franchise? You know, I think I was too young and too clueless about things really to feel the pressure. It was kind of like, oh, they gave me this movie. Cool. Oh, they gave me another one. Great. There wasn't really that much of franchise awareness because there weren't really that many franchises back then. Like there was James Bond. You know, you could argue yeah. Indiana Jones was turning into a franchise. Um, there were like kind of lower level franchises like Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. Those were sort of franchises, you know, but they weren't really considered franchises at the time. They were just considered sequels. In 1990, the, the same type of corporate branding awareness and the same type of idea of, oh, we're going to extend this out and make this this enormous tentpole. None of that lingo was even in the, in the zeitgeist at that time. That's super interesting. Yeah, like franchises are, I guess, a relatively new creation. So from your perspective, it was like, we made this great movie. Hopefully we get to make another. There was a decent amount of time in between uh, Gremlins and Gremlins 2. You can say that again. Yeah, like, did you have a sense in that? Like, what was that intervening time? Did you know that there would be a second one? Or were you surprised? Like, how did that process happen? Well, it was strange because, you know, if you look at the history of sequels, usually a movie comes out and then the sequel comes out very quickly after that. Yeah. Um, interestingly, if you go back to uh, 1984, you see that the three big movies, Gremlins, Ghostbusters, and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. What a solid year. <laughs> throw in Purple Rain and Beverly Hills Cop, oh and you have one God, of the best. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was a great year. If you look, Gremlins had a sequel six years later, Ghostbusters had a sequel five years later, and Indiana Jones had a sequel five years later. So there was actually kind of a big gap in between sequels, at least when it came to really big budget stuff. I think there was a real feeling they didn't want to rush out with a bad idea and and kind of wreck the franchise. So there were a lot of ideas that were floated for Gremlins 2, like Gremlins in Vegas was one idea. <laughs> um, what does that look like? Was there, did those go beyond the idea phase? Gremlins in Vegas? Is there like an outline kicking around somewhere? There probably is. You'd have to ask Joe Dante that. There probably is an outline somewhere. I know this, that they threw the outline at Warner Brothers. And at that time, you have to remember, the technology was so, um, I guess you could say, embryonic. I mean, they didn't even have CGI. So when they came back with the price tag for Gremlins destroying Vegas, it was something like $300 billion. As Joe Dante would say, Warner Brothers was basically, thank you, no. <laughs> so, um, so that was scrapped. And then I think they liked the idea of it being confined to a Manhattan skyscraper because that essentially lowered the budget and just kept it to sets that we could build and did build. So it was all shot on sets entirely. The lobby, all the interiors, those were all set. <clears throat> Well, we did three days in Manhattan, one day in Times Square where I try and get the cab and I can't get the cab. And then we did two days shooting exteriors. But once uh, Phoebe and I walk in through the malfunctioning revolving doors, yep. uh, that entire 
building lobby was built on a stage and it cost something insane, like six to eight million dollars to build that set. And it had working elevators and it had fully stocked um, stores. You could go into the store and the items were all there. They all, uh, the shelves were stocked. They had price tags on them and you could purchase them at a working cash register. It was designed so that you could take a camera and go into every store and go up elevators and out and shoot all sorts of things in continuous takes if you wanted to. And we did at times. There have always been rumors about a Gremlins 3. First, I guess I'll ask, are they true? <laughs> Well, here's the thing, you know, I've been asked, I've literally been asked about Gremlins 3 now for tw probably 28 years. Yeah. Um, there was very little movement on Gremlins 3 until about two or three years ago. Wow. And that's when I heard through the grapevine, and it was later confirmed that Chris Columbus decided to kind of dip his toe back into the water after a very successful run with Harry Potter for Warner Brothers, same, same studio. I think what they did was they took a look at the Gremlins 3 script and they did what's immediately what they would do, which is market research, which is like how much awareness is there of the Gremlins franchise after 30 to 35 years? Yeah. And I think they found that there was a very high awareness in people over, let's just say, 20 under 20 is very low awareness. So their solution to that problem, and it's a very, very clever solution, people have done it a lot, is an animated series in which they explain the Gremlins mythology to a generation that essentially has missed it. And that's what you have coming out next year with Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai for Warner Brothers Streaming, which is a 10-part series 10 episodes, 30 minutes, so that's 300 minutes, so you're talking five hours of gremlin cartoon mythology that's a prequel and will explain in cartoon form to young kids, kids as young as five to 15, everything that they didn't know. Once their appetite has been whetted for that, I think it's just a very short matter of time before they go into the really profitable thing, which is the live action movie, which then they would release worldwide. That's my guess. It sounds That's like at I least there's motion, some things in the works, so. There is more activity going on with the franchise in the last year and a half than there has been in the previous 30 years. So if you're a Gremlins fan, you should be excited. Cool, all right, that's a perfect note to move on to, if your game, some Gremlins trivia. Throw it my way. Okay, great. All right, so our first question. What is Gizmo's question in the last scene? If Phoebe and I have cable TV, cable? Yes, <laughs> yeah. In the original script, Gizmo was supposed to receive an invention from Randall Peltzer at the end of the movie. Do you remember what that invention was? Uh, it was something that was going to prevent him from getting uh, wet so he wouldn't mm -hmm. multiply. I think it was like, you know, one of those zip up things that you wear when you go surfing. Uh, yeah. What is that? A wet wetsuit? Wet yep. yep. A wetsuit so we wouldn't get wet. Uh, okay. The opening shots of New York in Gremlins 2 were shot as B roll for what superhero city slash movie? I'm pretty sure it was for either Superman 1 or Superman two yes you're right it was metropolis it was actually for superman for the quest for peace oh wow okay but that's okay what one two three four you know what numbers um okay last one there were other gremlin hybrids that were cut from the movie do you remember any specific ones i think i actually have one this one i've never understood this is what called penny yeah that wasn't in the movie. What are you talking about? And I guess it was a, uh, I think it was a, a, a Rick Baker invention that he did that just, because uh, he did all of the effects, obviously, yeah. for, um, for Gremlins too. I think it was one that just for whatever reason didn't make the cut. I think they had too many ideas. Well, yeah. okay. Well, as, as long as we're bringing in um, special guests like Penny, I think we have another guest who's ready to join. Uh -uh. Is that... Let's see who uh, this is. It is Robert Picardo. Hi, Robert. <coughs> Peltzer, I believe facial hair is outside the approved appearance parameters here at Clamp Tower. Obviously, in real life, you get along quite well, but 
on camera, you had to play somewhat enemies. Can we talk a little bit about creating the Forrester character? I had already worked with Joe a few times and he didn't read for Forrester, he offered it to me. And it seemed on the page like a pretty, you know, straight ahead guy you love to hate, just a, a dick. What's this? And that's Kingston Falls. That's my hometown. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Peltzer, do you know how much the Clamp organization has spent to provide its employees with art by recognized artists at this facility? Eye-pleasing, color-coordinated, authorized. Zach's character is from the Midwest of the United States that my character would never have visited and probably had complete contempt for. So when Peltzer has this cute little drawing of his sweet little hometown that does not fit into the approved art in my building where I control every detail, then he immediately is at odds with me. And, and of course, the only real fun part of the movie for the character is how he gets messed up by this female gremlin who, for whatever reason, becomes obsessed with him. So I had this idea that I wanted to be incredibly put together. I wanted Armani clothes. I wanted gorgeous shoes. I basically talked Joe into letting me have that $4,000 wig made with the big 80s hair. Uh, the shoes that I wear in the very opening shot of the movie, I asked Joe, I said, if you started on my expensive shoe stepping over a puddle, it would immediately set up my character's disdain for anything that wasn't perfect. My shoe is perfect, my suit is perfect, my hair is perfect, my limousine is perfect, and I have to step out into this crappy neighborhood to do my boss's bidding. And part of that incredibly put together aspect of my character was I said to Joe, I really want to ooze contempt and disdain for all of the underlings in the building by never learning any of their names. All of America knew what barcode technology was from the supermarket at that point. I said, could I have a little sort of device? It was a barcode scanner and everyone who works in the building has a barcode, no name tag. And I scan them and I read their name off of the little machine. And Joe, for God bless him, you know, when he said yes to that, however many thousands of dollars were spent on that yeah. device, on making all the barcodes, he was so, you know, he was really gracious to me, took that idea and said yes on the spot. I have to tell you, the most fun director to work with in the world, Joe Dante. He makes uh, a set of a movie like Gremlins, which at the time had a very, very big price tag on it. He just makes it like a playground. Uh, it's so relaxed, everybody gets to do their best work. He's the proverbial kid in a, a sandbox who is never happier than when he's uh, directing a movie. There's a line that Bob does um, that was cut from the movie where he scans my barcode and then there, there he's got a machine and it spits out a piece of paper. Um, and uh, he then tears it off and looks at it and it's got all sorts of information uh, ominously, including my SAT scores, which is really <laughs> ahead of its uh, my character's SAT scores. But there's one take you'll see on the blooper reel where the machine doesn't work, and Bob <laughs> does this uh, throwaway line where he tears it off, and you can hear everybody cracking up on the crew. And he looks at the crew and he goes, "Well, it's hard." <laughs> we asked a bunch of fans on social media what they would ask you if they had the opportunity. If there is a new movie, who should get a cameo? There's some great cameos, uh, especially in two. Who should get a cameo? Who would you cast? Well, if there is a Gremlins 3, we, we should, in theory, witness the first human gremlin offspring of Greta the Gremlin and Mr. Forster is what I'm thinking. Whose voice would you have in mind? You could go very comic and make it like Gilbert Gottfried or something like that, or you could uh, you could just go with like, um, you know, an amazing voice actor like John Kassir is a great voice actor, Frank Welker, Michael Winslow, all of whom worked on the first Gremlins as various Gremlins. If it were a female Gremlin, a female human Gremlin offspring, I think, Tara Strong, she does an awful lot of uh, varied uh, female animation. And then Miley Cyrus could do the vocal numbers. <laughs> we were thinking, if you guys are game, that we could recreate a scene primarily between the two of you. I'll have a line or two at the end. 
doesn't that 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 doesn't matter. Um, but are you are you game? Can well, you give me a shot. We're professional. Okay, great. And action. Uh, Mr. Porster, sir, I, I I need to speak to you. Mr. Peltzer, how surprising. Even though you got yourself arrested here last night, you've come back. Did you miss us? Sir, you've got to evacuate the building. Uh, not the suit, please. Evacuate the building? Why is that? Because there are creatures in it, sir. Creatures? Yes, well, at least they start out as these small furry animals, and then what happens is they eat after midnight. They metamorphose, and they form these cocoons. Peltzer, <laughs> you're having a psychotic episode. Thanks for sharing it with us. Sir, you've got to listen to me. Wait a minute, this is good. First they start out furry, then they have cocoons. Well, uh, first they have to eat, and uh, then they turn into cocoons. Yeah, well, sure, you're going into a cocoon, you want to have a little something first. And cut. That was great, we did it. We have a rapid fire game. So there's a bunch of different types of gremlins in Gremlins 2, and I'm gonna name a type of gremlin, and you guys say whether or not they actually made it to the film, or if it's just one we made up. Okay. Okay. So, flashing gremlin. Uh, made it up. I oh, think no, it's in the movie. <laughs> flashing gremlin, yes, real. Okay, elephant gremlin. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Correct, no elephant gremlin, we made that up. Tattoo artist gremlin. I'm gonna guess there were so, so, so many quick jokes in Gremlins 2, it's hard to remember, but I'm gonna say yes, it was in Gremlins 2. Correct, that is correct. Robert, if you had to get a Gremlins-related tattoo, any Gremlin, what would you get? Well, I think uh, Greta would be very upset um, if I didn't get her. So I, and uh, just as a quick aside, I had to operate the Greta puppet. When the, when the puppet is jumped on Forster and he's running down the hallway and he's being, uh, you know, he's being kind of molested by her and trying to push yeah. her away. That was a butt puppet, as they call it, which means, which means that my arm was up the butt of the puppet, and I was okay. controlling the puppet. We didn't, um, we didn't talk too much about, but had you ever had experience working with puppets of any kind before this film? As as um, Zach pointed out, this was before CGI. Everything was practical. There were many different versions of the same puppet that could do different specific physical actions. Okay. Rick Baker's work was stunning on Gremlins 2, incredibly varied. There were just so many different puppets and versions of each puppet, but my favorite puppet in the movie is of course the one that could speak, the, the one that Tony Randall voiced. The yes. uh, gen Was that the genius Gremlin? I don't remember the name. <laughs> It's the brain. Oh, I think there are some fascinating ramifications here for the future. Tony Randall did his performance before they even created the brain gremlin. He just did the dialogue. And then Rick Baker came up with this animatronic brain gremlin in which you took the recorded impulses. Okay, remember this is before the internet. And you fed the recorded impulses into a very embryonic computer and the computer translated the voice impulses into muscle twitches they're feeding all of this dialogue into this computer and it's translating it into facial muscle movements on a puppet with like 59 different face possible facial expressions and it's all happening in real time. The puppet is actually in front of you and talking every time you see it talk. Now, was that civilized? No, clearly not. Fun, but in no sense civilized. It was like magic. For a makeup guy to be able to do that with computer technology, I mean, just the, the breadth of knowledge that, and the ability that this guy has. He's the Leonardo da Vinci of the movie business. They'll go back and they'll look at Rick Baker and they'll say, what this guy did was so revolutionary. I mean, I don't know if you know this, the Academy had to come up with a category to honor him. And then they honored him in it because he completely no. revolutionized makeup and effects in a way that, that nobody had seen before. Well, thank you guys so much. It was so fun to talk and everybody at home, obviously, Go watch Gremlins 2. And hey, tweet at Sci-Fi your ideas for Gremlins 3. I would also love it if people watching this, if you've enjoyed this, 
and you'd like to see more Gremlins related content, if you would either go to my Instagram, which is my initials, ZWG and the word man, ZWG man, and uh, also on Twitter at ZWG man. And if you want to see the Forster wig still in use on the world's yes. oldest gigolo, go on Instagram to Robert <laughs> underscore Picardo and you will see the wig happy and well and still working more than I am. This has been super fun and it's a year. No, no, no sound. I don't have any, uh... Oh, no.